This sounds like a stupid question. Probably is, because, yeah, go ahead. Skilled managers equals high morale, which equals all that cool stuff that you cannot pay for and you can't punish for. When you close off that feedback channel, you are not going to be able to hear the truth. In the first microseconds, your brain can't tell the difference between physical danger and what we call social danger. I'm, I'm pissed off at you. Oh, me? Specifically? Well, you know, just because you're my boss and all. Employees tend to get promoted until they reach their level of incompetence. Go forward and don't suck. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Managing with Mind and Heart podcast. I am solo today. I'm your host, Mike Nash. And I want to chat today with you a little bit about some of the deeper aspects of what it means to be a manager, a people leader. Um, and along with that, some of the hidden commitments that we might have that can get in the way of our effectiveness as managers can lead to us not being as effective as managers, but also lead to us being burnt out and unhappy and frustrated. So we're going to get a little deeper into what management is all about and then some of the roadblocks to us really thriving in that role. You know, managing, and we've talked about this on this show so many times, but managing is a higher calling. It is it is so much more than I think what some people might think it is kind of at first blush. It's It's not just air traffic controlling work or you know, being a chess master and making sure all the people and the parts are going in the right places and doing the right thing. It is so much more than that, right? It's a higher calling. It is at its core, management is about equipping others, about empowering others, about meeting others' needs. It's about developing others. You know, we've talked about this example uh, many times on this show as well. You know, the idea that to be a good manager, for example, your people have to believe that you have their best interests at heart. So, so, so just look at that. That, is, that alone is such a, a broader scope and such a deeper thing than just making sure the right people are doing the right tasks in the right time, right? For me to be an effective manager, my people have to know that I have their best interests at heart. And, and why is that, right? Well, a couple things uh, just to review. If I you know, have a manager and I can tell or I can discern or I at least maybe even am suspicious that that person doesn't even care about me, that's actually scary, right? This person has a power differential. This person controls so many things that matter to me, like my time and my tasks and my reputation at work and my evaluation and whether I get to keep my job. And, you know, more than half my waking hours, this person has a fair amount of control over me. And if I don't think this person actually cares about me, that's scary. And if I am coming to work in fear every day, then I'm in self-protection mode, right? My sympathetic nervous system has kicked in and I'm in fight, flight, or freeze or fawn. I can't perform um, up to par. I can't be creative. I can't be empathetic. I can't bring my best self, right? So it's an example of this higher calling, just, just that piece right there, right? That as a manager, I have to find ways of demonstrating to the people that I supervise that I actually care about them as human beings. Not, not you know, I'm going to be their buddy or their friend outside of work, but they have to be able to see that. And that's just one example of this, this, this higher calling, that management is so much more than just checking the boxes, right? It is about helping people grow and develop and thrive. Um, you know, again, if, if, if my people don't believe that I have their best interests at heart, not only are they afraid, they are not going to have high morale, right? They're going to be discouraged. They're going to be not investing their, their minds and their hearts at work. They're not going to be engaged, right? And so I'm not going to be able to have the effectiveness as a team that I would want because my people just really don't have their skin in the game. So, you know, we've talked about all that. I'm just, I'm just kind of giving examples of, of, of the idea, the fact that management is really about meeting needs, right? I mean, it, it's other things as well, but, but at its core, 
management management is about being there for your people. So the idea here, or the the concept, is that management, in in a large degree, is about giving, and not receiving. And and I want you to think about that. That's that's actually a really important concept. We come to work. We show up to work as managers with a heart of service to some degree, right? To a heart of giving, with a heart of giving, not coming to work to get, to receive. And when you think about it, that takes a lot of emotional intelligence. I mean, that takes a lot of emotional health to be the kind of person that can day in and day out be there for others as, I, as opposed to being there to get what you need and have your needs met, right? Now, before I go on, I just want to say I'm not trying to set a super high bar here. I'm not trying to say you have to be perfect and you can't be human and, you know, that you just have to be the healthiest person alive to be effective as a manager. We'll, we'll, get, to, we'll get to that in a minute. I, I, but I do want to start with this idea or this, this concept that management really is about giving, not receiving. And, and that right there can be a bit of a newsflash, I think, for some people, for some managers, that going into management truly is about, about service, about giving, about empowering others, um, equipping others, uh, meeting others' needs, and not about getting your own needs met. And so here's where the hidden commitments come in that I was uh, referring to. Um, the idea that I'd like to talk about today is that when we have subconscious commitments. And another way of putting that is we have unmet needs that we're not aware of. What's going to happen, and we're not going to know we're doing this most of the time, is we are going to do what we can to get those needs met at work. Our energy is going to be about receiving, right? It's going to be about filling those gaps that we, again, aren't aware of, but are truly there. It's going to be then about in some ways, in many ways, requiring people and circumstances around us to be a certain way so that we can have those needs met. And when your energy is about receiving and um, trying to get your needs met, it's really hard to simultaneously be about meeting the needs of others. Now, remember, our, th these commitments I'm talking about, these, they're, they're deep, they're, they're unconscious, they're not easy to discover but they absolutely impact our behaviors if left unexamined. And I'm going to say that again. These needs that we are unconsciously trying to get met, they absolutely impact our behaviors if left unexamined. So some examples of that. Um, let's say that I have a deep need to to be affirmed because I have this need to be liked. I have this, I have this unexamined commitment to having that need met as much and as many times as possible throughout the day. I have to have proof that I am liked. Now, now what might be underneath that? Maybe I don't feel good about myself. Maybe that's my deeper commitment there, right? My commitment would be, I want to feel better about who I am. If I can get people to like me, if I can get a lot of signs and demonstrations that people actually really like me, I'm going to feel better about myself. Now, again, remember, this is unconscious. I, I'm not aware this is happening, but here's the point. The, th this need, this, this gap, you know, I don't feel good about myself, so this hidden commitment to feel better about myself leading to this hidden commitment to make others like me, that absolutely will impact my behaviors, right? For example, what, what might I do if my deeper commitment there is to be liked, is to find examples and, and um, signs and demonstrations that I'm liked? Well, I might um, not make hard decisions that people won't like. I might make all my decisions by consensus. I might change my mind a lot. I might say one thing to one person and something to so and something different to someone else because I want to be liked by both parties. Um, I might have a really hard time 
holding people accountable, having some of those difficult conversations. Um, I, and then personally, I may really burn out. It's not just my behaviors. How, how might I end up feeling, right? I might end up feeling certainly unfulfilled and frustrated. And in a lot of ways, not only less effective as a manager, but just really not enjoying myself very much in this role. Here's another example. Let's say I have a deep need to, to feel a lot of control, right? To have, a, to have control over things and people and circumstances. And, and what may be underneath that is most likely some, some version of fear. Um, there's there's going to be something going on unconsciously for me that if I don't have tight control over the situations around me, then I'm going to start feeling afraid and anxious. And so I have this, again, let's say this unexamined deeper commitment to control because my deeper commitment underneath that, of course, is to not feel fear, right? So what kind of behaviors am I going to be engaging in, right? Is it likely that I'm going to be um, micromanaging? I'm going to be needing people to check with me a lot more and I want to be brought in on everything and I don't want to be left out of any conversations and always this fear that things are happening that I can't, that I don't really have a hand in. Um, I'm going to be certainly then showing up in ways that take autonomy away from others, which is going to impact their sense of engagement and their morale. Um, I might even find myself in relationships at work where, boy, there's sure a lot of people that kind of are, are acting resistant to me. I get a lot of complaints about micromanaging or people are trying to kind of push me out of their worlds. And why is that? Why do I have all these rebellious employees? And then I tighten my control even more. You know, I'm getting into some of these vicious cycles. So all these behaviors are a result of this commitment to having control that I'm not really aware of. And that commitment to having control, of course, is a symptom of a deeper commitment to not feeling afraid. I might have a um, maybe it's a commitment to feeling respected, right? To have proof around me at all times that I'm respected. And then I become, and, and again, what's, what's underneath that? Maybe again, that's some sense that I don't, I, I don't value myself, um, as much as I should. I need affirmation and, and confirmation from others that I'm, in, that I'm valuable. So again, I'm looking for uh, signs of respect, um, become then maybe hypersensitive and a little maybe even paranoid about um, you know interpreting comments and behaviors as just another sign that there's that there is a lack of respect for me right then I get into confirmation bias right so again it's a it's a it's a hidden commitment to feeling something or not feeling something that I'm not aware of that results in behaviors that are going to not only be not effective as a manager, but really kind of hurt me as well, right? They keep me stuck in these cycles, burn me out. Uh, I, I end up just really not enjoying and find, you know, finding any joy in this, in this work at all. So what do we do about this? This is just, just a brief episode on what are some of the ways that I can turn the unexamined life into the examined life. And I just want to share one technique that I that has been really valuable for me and for others. It's an acronym called RAIN, spelled R-A-I-N. And I'll, I'll tell you how it works. RAIN starts with R, which stands for recognize. And I think of the four components of rain this is the this is the toughest one because this is where you go from unconscious to conscious this is where you actually notice the thing right so recognize is really the main part of the journey i am noticing that i have this need for control i am noticing that i want to be liked um, whatever it happens to be this one's tricky again it's hard to get to this i think that one pathway to recognition is noticing patterns. Again, why do I happen to have so many people in not just this job, but other in other places I've managed 
that seem to be kind of rebellious and maybe, you know, pushing back on me a lot. And, you know, is, is it just a coincidence? Have I just happened to hire a lot of people that are kind of anti-authority or wait, I'm the common denominator here, right? What, what is, what is going on that is creating this, this pattern of other people's behaviors? What is it that I'm doing? Right? So the first way that I might notice that I might discover is by noticing patterns of relationship dynamics around me. And that could lead to the second way I might want to trace back to what's going on underneath, which is, oh, what's the behavior that I continually engage in, right? I tend to uh, exert a lot of control or, or need to proofread everybody's work before they send it or um, whatever it happens to be. Um, this behavior that I find myself engaging in quite often, let's look underneath. We don't engage in behaviors for no reason, right? There's always a reason. So let's, let's do some discovery here. What might be happening inside? What are some of the, the needs, the hidden commitments, the feelings that I am dealing with inside that are causing me to do these things? Think of it this way. The behaviors that I'm engaging in or not engaging in, in the case of maybe not having hard conversations with people, there's a reason I'm doing that or not doing the thing. And it's because it feels better not to do the thing or to do the thing, right? It feels better somehow to um, ask people to report every step to me. It feels better. I feel less afraid. It feels better to uh, not confront people or give hard feedback because then I don't have to feel this horrible anxiety about not being liked, right? So notice that those behaviors that you're engaging in quite frequently, you're doing them because they feel better. So then you can go there. Then you can spend some time with that. Oh, okay. It feels better because I have this uh, I have this high need to control things, right? Or I have this high need to be liked. So whatever it takes, again, of the four components of rain, I think this is the uh, this is the biggest hurdle. It's it's discovering what is actually going on inside. So let's say we've got that. Let's say we've discovered that, yeah, I get, I get really anxious when I don't have a lot of control, or I get really scared when I don't feel liked. I, you know, when I, I start, I feel rejected very easily, and that makes me feel very um, hopeless, or whatever the thing might be. Okay, that's rain. That's R. That's the that's the recognize. A stands for allow, and this for a lot of us is really counterintuitive. Because you know what we tend to do when we discover something inside of us that we don't um, that we don't, that we wish wasn't there, uh, we do a couple things. We beat ourselves up. I'm such a terrible person. Um, what's wrong with me? And we also we 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 try to get rid of it really fast. We try to push it away. We we basically find a way. We we want to find a way to get rid of this really really fast. And what I'm going to suggest that we do instead is the opposite of that. So the opposite of that is A, which is accept. And it again, it's really counterintuitive because it's around just a uh, just allowing, right? It the the A is allow, allow it to be there, just allow it. It let it let it be. There's a there's a famous story in the Buddhist tradition. Um, Mara is the god of shadows, and Mara's job basically is to just to constantly shoot arrows. And these are um, emotions. These are human experiences. These arrows are things like anger and jealousy and shame and embarrassment. And, and, and Mora's uh, the God of shadow sh constantly shooting these horrible things at, at you, right? Basically in the tradition of uh, the story of, of Buddha, um, the, the Buddha is having these arrows um, flung at him over and over and over again. And the Buddha would practice being aware of what was uh, of the arrow and bringing compassion to it. And the arrows would turn into flowers. And there's this story of um, Buddha in his um, little cabin and Mora comes to the door. And instead of pushing Mora out, uh, the Buddha says, hey, welcome, come on in, let's have some tea. And the idea is to face this thing that you're noticing about yourself and and kind of with that spirit of of welcome 
you know, welcome need to be liked. Welcome need for control. Come on in. Let's have some tea. It's, it's, it's an embracing it in a sense. It's, it's not saying I want to continue to struggle with this, but it's not this immediate revulsion and shame and pushing it away. It really is about accepting your humanness, letting it be, recognizing that you share this uh, this drive to be liked or this need for control or this um, urge to be respected or this jealousy or this ambition or whatever it is that you notice, that you share this with so many millions of other people, right? It's part of your humanity. So we accept it without judgment, without shame. And that right there, that piece is, it's a, it's a beautiful journey. It's a deep journey in, in life to come to accept all the parts of you without shame. So we start with recognize. We basically kind of discover and notice the thing. We go from there to accept or allow. Both those words are used for the, um, for the A. And we just let it be there without judgment, without shame. Those are the first two steps. The I stands for investigate. And this is the place where you get to kind of play detective and um, spend a little bit of time or a lot of time or just a little bit of time every day or on the weekends digging in or even in that moment, just a little bit of investigation. Huh, what is this about? This is where you bring curiosity as opposed to judgment and shame, right? This is where you bring curiosity. I wonder what this is about. Is this need for control part of the human experience that everybody struggles with? And on top of that, here's some reasons why I myself might have maybe a little bit more of a pronounced need for control. Um, maybe it's part of your childhood experiences, you know, whatever it is. This just allows a little bit of digging in because, of course, the more you can kind of take it apart and look at the different pieces, the more successful you're going to ultimately be in you know, eventually um, lessening its grip on you. Um, so, that, so that investigation part is, is kind of the piece that I think ultimately leads to um, the – that hidden commitment may be uh, becoming lighter, becoming less intense over time because it starts to make sense. Um, it loses its power because you really kind of start to see through it. And the N stands for nurture. This is where the self-compassion comes in. This is that place where you recognize that this um, feeling that you've been struggling with or this need, it is a form of suffering. Frankly, it is it is it has hurt you. In some cases, it might have even hurt others. It has made you less effective. Is it has made you feel burnt out? It has caused you not to get as much joy out of life as you could have. And so, you bring a sense of mercy and compassion and self love to the table, and you um, you basically send yourself compassion. You 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 treat yourself the way you would treat a friend who was struggling. So this process, this this R A I N, this can happen in um, in moments. This can just be right in the moment as you start to notice something. This can be something that you take more time on, maybe during meditation in your um, in your mornings before you go to work. But here's what I can guarantee: if you regularly practice rain, you're going to see some changes over time. You're going to notice several things. Let's start with the R. Your ability to recognize, to actually notice the hidden commitment or the feeling that you're struggling with is going to increase. You're going to become much more adept at no noticing what's going on underneath the behaviors. One of the reasons for that, of course, is because you're treating yourself so much better, so much less shame. And so those – um unhelpful behaviors and feelings and commitments, they feel more free to come up. They, they, they're more willing to be seen by you because you're not going to trash on them. You're not going to treat yourself like crap when they show up, right? So when you become a more graceful person toward yourself, those things are more likely to appear. So number one, uh, as you practice this, um, you're going to be uh, quicker at discovering 
some of these uh, feelings and um, urges and the things that get in the way. Um, you're going to be much more, when, when we get to the allow, the A, you're going to be much more willing to give yourself grace and just let that thing be without immediately pushing it away, So, which means you're going to have more peace within. The I, investigate, you're actually going to become a better and better detective, I promise. You're, it's going to be easier for you to trace back where these things came from and what's maintaining them today. And then the N, in nurture. Yeah, you're going to become a person who is more um, self-compassionate, which has a really cool um, side effect. Um, you also become much more graceful and compassionate toward others. That's it today. Uh, again, management, it's a, it's a deeper, higher calling. It's about giving more than it's about receiving, and that requires a fair amount of emotional intelligence. And, of course, emotional intelligence has been described in many ways, but including I am able to recognize what's happening inside of me and make good choices based on that. That's, that's part of EQ. Um, and so, yeah, it takes a fair amount of EQ to be able to be a great manager because what can get in the way of management of, of managing well are these unconscious drives and hidden commitments. And so we have the acronym RAIN to help us work through those and discover and um, uh, get to the point where those urges and um, feelings and struggles kind of lose their strength, they lose their power, and I become more effective as a manager. And I definitely love my job a lot more when I'm doing this kind of work. So thanks for listening in. This has been the Managing with Mind and Heart podcast. Don't forget to like us and check us out at www.nashconsulting.com. Thanks, everybody. Hey, folks, wait, don't go yet. Please stay with me for one second here. I want to let you know about a couple cool little goodies that we have available for you. If you dig this podcast, you will probably also dig our Managing with Mind and Heart newsletter. This is a monthly newsletter where we share articles that we write about, hey, how to thrive as a manager, how to lead teams that are characterized by high morale, engagement, psychological safety, care and respect, collaboration, and high performance. You can sign up for this newsletter by texting the word leading to the number 66866. Additionally, you can go to our website and sign up for the newsletter there. Our website is www.nashconsulting.com. And of course, if you're not already aware, we have our cornerstone program for leaders and managers, and it is called Managing with Mind and Heart. Go figure. This program is something that we often bring into organizations to work with all their leaders on helping them get aligned and singing off the same sheet of music with best practice management skills and behaviors. We've brought this to hundreds of organizations at this point with really good results. And if you are not able or inclined to bring our program in-house twice a year in the spring and in the fall we offer this six-day managing with mind and heart leadership development program online for anybody that would like to sign up and join us to learn more about this online course and to register you can go to our website once again that's nashconsulting.com or send us an email at contact at nashconsulting.com. All right, that's all. That's it. See you later. Bye.